everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our service. I see we have visitors. Harold and back in the back row here. I didn't get to meet them. Glad you're here. Glad all of you are here. Amen. In Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, it says, Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you will remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them. But you are always the same. You will live forever. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, as we concentrate on how consistent you are as a God and how you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, we pray that you would give us insights through the pastor and give him the words that are easy to say and easy for us to listen to. Lord, for all that's done and all that's said here, we want you to have honor and glory. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Glad you're here. Amen. Hey, I'm thankful for all the visitors. So if you were visitors, and you're not visitor now. You're here. I'm glad that you're all here. Well, let's take these prayers to the Lord this morning. Let's bow our heads together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for a great day that you've given us. We thank you for our Sunday school hour. Father, we had uh, praises in our Sunday school hour for answers to prayer, and we had prayer needs in there. So I lift up all those prayer needs that we heard this morning in our Sunday school hour. Lord, we pray for the needs of each one that has come out this morning and the, the prayers that they each have in their circle of concern for the neighborhood and for loved ones. And so we lift those up to you. Lord, as I think about all the things that are going on in our world today, uh, Lord, there are, there are floods, storms, and fires, and then we think of Afghanistan, Lord, and, and Haiti and all those ones overseas, and we think of the missionaries that work there and all those that are trying to come out of that country. We lift them up this morning, Lord. They need your comfort and knowledge that you're with them. We pray for those Christians in those areas and those leaders. We pray for the leader of our country, Lord, and all those that lead this country. We pray that they would uh, pray, take time to pray, and look to you. Sometimes, Lord, as we look at the situation, we think it's impossible for anyone to fix it, and it really is for human able to fix it. But, Lord, you can, and we just pray that you would. Lord, this morning, take care of us. Lord, we pray for uh, each one of these people this morning that have mentioned a need for healing in their lives. And we pray for Jack and Carolyn. And, Lord, we pray for uh, the Christian families out here. We pray for Rusty and his knee there, Lord, and Doris and Dan, and especially tomorrow morning, Lord, as she goes, we pray that you would be with her. We pray for Margie's uh, prayer of a miracle that she's had in her life. And then we think about, it's been a year tomorrow, I think, Lord, of, of missing Walt, and, and we can see his face uh, as he was with us worshiping in our church. And uh, We know where he is. He's in heaven with you. We thank you and praise you for that. We pray for Joyce and, and her uh, praise that she had this morning of a good test. We pray for Abby away at college. We pray for Mike and, and Beth and, and uh, Joanna there as they uh, go along without her, Lord, and, and miss her, Lord. We know that they can talk to her every day and text her and everything, but it's just not the same as being home. We pray for all of our school kids, as it says on our sign board out there, going back to school. They need to know that their church is lifting them up in prayer. We pray for all those that, that we've talked to and witnessed to in other places. Uh, we pray for Tim Felder this morning that uh, fell and broke ribs and a leg, Lord. We told him we'd pray for him. Lord, anyone that has prayed and said, Lord, that they would pray for people in the community or at the stores that they've been or wherever at work, Lord, we lift them up in prayer this morning. Be with Jacob as he goes back to college. And then, we, Lord, we think of the tragedy down just down the road of a, a house fire. That would be a terrible thing to have happen. So, Lord, we just pray for that family. And, and, and that is, uh, we need your, your, your uh, prayers to lift them up this morning and encourage them in these days. Lord, we pray for our worship service today that you would speak to us through the message. 
through the special and song today, Lord, and then our, our worship day all day today and our Sunday night service tonight, we just ask for your presence in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank amen. you. Can I tell you a little bit of a story? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Guys turn around and look like, what? <laughs> well, I have to talk about him there. Uh, in our Sunday school class, especially this morning, by the way, the kids can go to junior church. They're already going. <laughs> Don't have to announce it. They already know. In our Sunday school class this morning, we were talking about uh, things and callings in our life and who tells us sometimes it's another in the church that might nudge us a little bit and say, hey, God, I need you to do this. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit telling us what to do. And I, I remember, how many years has it been now, guy? Two. Two years? Three in the, in, in the spring. It'll be, this Easter will be three years. Amen. All right. Well, we, we were participating in, a, in an egg hunt here for the little burg of, of, you call this a burg or a city? Village. A village, okay. A village up here in town. And, and normally Easter is uh, a whole other meeting than eggs for the church, of course. And uh, we decided that we would uh, join the school back here in, in helping the kids do an egg hunt. So we went and they came over here and we packed eggs up. And I don't know, three or four thousand eggs went up there and put them in the park right there by the pavilion. And we enjoyed doing that for two or three years at a time. And one day, there was a tall guy up there, <laughs> and he was just standing in the middle there, and I, and I thought, I gotta, I'm gonna go talk to this guy. And so we were standing there just talking about things. And, and I don't remember exactly what I said or anything like that, but Guy Eastridge and his wonderful wife over there, Debbie, you know, we, they're, they're our cooks. Now, uh, God knew what he was doing when he sent him here. You might get called over to their house for dinner. But that changed everything, didn't it? And Guy has found Jesus Christ in his heart. Amen. And he has salvation. And he's working on that, working out his salvation in these days. And Debbie, and they have been a great part of our church here. Amen. Amen. That's right. And we love having them, just like the rest of you. Uh, this church loves one another. We have a, an adult Sunday school class, and the other class, one of them meets here, and we're rebuilding. We're trying to get our, our, our groups going together so we can have classes together, and eventually we're hoping to start our building program this spring. Right now we're waiting on the Lord with that, and sometimes we have to be patient, but we have great things ahead, uh, and we know that because... The Lord is faithful, and the Lord is constant. Right. And that's what I'm going to preach about this morning, is the constancy of God. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Malachi. Now, I don't even remember whether I ever preached out of the book of Malachi before, but Malachi chapter 3, and just I'm going to just read verse 6. If someone gets that real fast, I'll let you read it. And then you can become the reading celebrity this morning. <laughs> Who wants to do that? Anybody? At Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I am the Lord, and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. It's a simple little thing, but I want to talk about this morning. How many of you think that a lot of things have changed? Say, let's just say in the last five years. Because so many things are changing around us that we've never seen before in our lifetime. And, and you hear people as you go around and you start to discuss things. Everything changes, doesn't it? And as we look back, not too far, the, the, we're in the electronics age, and in fact, I saw on the news a, a person the other day was on there, and they were talking about all this texting and emails and things like that, and they said the, the, the what do you call it, the, uh, what do you, when you get married, what is it, Joyce, your, 
what what do you go on a, a trip? Honeymoon. Honeymoon. The honeymoon is over. I just, I just, come on, will that work? The honeymoon is over with that, and they said people are getting sick of being bothered with the, the emails and the texting and all that, and, that, and that, that's over. And they're talking about having to put your phone away because it's giving people a headaches and everything, and mainly keeping them away from their work. And so I know there's a lot of good things, a lot of people like those things, but everything has changed. There was a retired man that visited his birthplace, and, and I wanted to ask you, because this guy's story is probably would be a lot, have you ever gone back to the area that you lived in when you were a child and realized, hey, the little store that I used to go in, the hardware's not there, the dime store's not there, they tore it all down and put a mall in there, they brought a freeway right through Grandpa's farm and cut it right in half. Ever seen that yeah. happen? Yeah, you don't even recognize it, and that's what he said. He said, I visited the town of my boyhood days and found almost everything changed. The, the community school, the little church are, are all gone. The mom and pop stores, the restaurants are gone, and the franchise businesses have come in and taken their place, and I don't even recognize it where I used to live and walk around as a kid, and I can say that because I remember my dad preaching at Swartz Creek, the little church downtown on First Street, and I walked across the back streets to Mary Craco School, some of you know where that is, and uh, First Street, I used to go to the sports shop on the corner, used to go down to the hardware, and the funny thing was, I, I was probably six or eight at that time and I remember going into hardware and you know as a kid they sold nails by the pound so I would go into bins and I'd pull a nail out that I wanted and go over to the guy and say how much for this one nail <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he always would say well I'll give you that nail kid but I said well I want a lot more how many can I get for 47 cents or something like <laughs> how much can I get for this and he'd give me a little wad of nails and I would go back home to the church, and, and you've probably heard the story where I was building a shed right on the back of the church. Mm -hmm. And you picture this right over there by uh, uh, Dan's, you know, I, I built a shed there, and when I put the roof on it, it came right across the window, <laughs> you know, the glass part of the window of the adult classroom, and I tarred it right to it. <laughs> and you know what? They never said anything about it. They never did. So, you know, things are changing. I don't know how I got off on that. But when we go back to our place of childhood, there's so much that is changing. His, uh, the, here's the thing. The God about whom my parents and my grandparents and my uncle taught me has not changed. Amen. Amen. Praise God, he's the same today as he was back then. In our Sunday school class, we looked at some of the, the main characters of faith in the book of Hebrews. You know, there's a lot of good things in there. Read the book of Hebrews. And the same thing is, can, can happen in our lives today as happened then. And we found some stories right in our Sunday school class that proved that, that God works in us in the same way. It says, so that the prophet, for, so said the prophet, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. This prophet old grasped the truth of the constancy of God. See, he wanted to show his people its implications. So let us explore today some of these implications from, I want to I take two different viewpoints today. So let's take the, the uh, what does the constancy of God mean from God's point of view? Even though humans have changed their attitude about sin, do you think that we have? No. You know, you hear the world saying things like God, uh, the, the, humanist, the humanist would say, sin, what is sin? There's no such thing. Really? A bit of the beast survives in all of us. Traces of selfishness, but not sin. Sin is a Jewish taboo and a Victorian convention. There was also a psychologist 
that has said sin is a psychopathic aspect of adolescent mentality. And we've heard these different things said about sin today. Some who do not agree with the humanist or the psychologist apply the wrong test to their deeds. Uh, they justify their deeds by the test of popularity. Well, like they say they feel that if everyone is doing a certain thing, it must be all right. Is that the way it is? I think we say that a lot of times. Look at the big crowd over there. They must be, yeah, let's go over and join them because they're all doing it. In fact, uh, others justify moral acts by the test of legality. Uh, our country, one state at a time, has, has legalized different things. But just because something illegal doesn't make it moral, does it? Right, right. right. For others, you know the Ten Commandments. They've actually put together an eleventh commandment. Thou shalt not get caught. Oh, yes. Yeah. It, I, I heard one guy one time say, well, if I don't get caught, it's all right, isn't it? <laughs> that's, the, that's the human mentality, you know, and if they think, that, okay, well, we've got away with it. We, uh, we did it, and if it was a sin, I got away with it. I, I, you know, here's the thing. We might get away with it for a while, but we're not. God's going to catch up to us. Right. Right. And even in our, our life, if we live in sin, it'll catch up to us here on earth as well. But sin has not changed. Sin is still rebellion against God, and the person who rebels is actually God's enemy. It's a marvel of the cross. While we were enemies, Paul tells us, we were reconciled to God by the death of his sons. Yep. His son. It is because God does not change his attitude towards sin that Christ went to the cross. God does not change in his love toward all people. We are valuable in his sight. God loves every man, woman, boy, and girl in the world. God does not change in his evaluation of human souls. David asked, What is man that thou art merciful or mindful of him? Psalms 8 4. Jesus said, How much then is a man better than a sheep? Matthew 12, 12. Both of those texts, uh, though thousands of years apart, suggest the supreme worth of human, of human personality. God's evaluation of human worth hasn't changed. He is not up there saying, well, I guess these humans aren't worth much anymore. I give up. I quit. That's what humans do, but not God. Right, right. He is still the same. Also, God does not change in his plans and his purposes. His methods may change. His approach may vary. He may even discard one group because of disobedience and choose another to, to be used in carrying out his plans. You realize that God has a plan and that if he has called us to do something uh, as individuals or as a church and we don't do it and we just lay down and let it happen, he'll, he'll get the job done by going on to the next church and put it over there. He wants to use us. And when he calls us to do something, if we're obedient and pay attention, then uh, we need to do that. Dr. E.Y. Mullins once said, the apparent changes in God are simply his unresting desire to bless men. God's goals remain the same. You know what? God's first goal is salvation. Right. Salvation for all who will believe. Right. Paul said in 1 Timothy that it is God's will for all people to be saved. He hasn't said, okay, well, I'll take all of this color, or I'll take all... It's everyone. Amen. It is his will, his desire that all be saved. You're, none of you, us are let out, left out, or any of those people outside is not going to church today. They are in his will to be saved. But they just need to answer the calling. Amen. 
And if they don't know it, then we need to tell them, don't we? God's second goal is the indoctrination of the saved. Next Sunday, in our Sunday school class, we're going to be talking about uh, things that we need to do. Well, all right, we're, we're saved. We've asked the Lord into our heart. And in the years ahead, in the months ahead after that, then we need to find out what God has for our life Amen. and build that relationship. Paul continued in 1 Timothy by saying that God desires all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's one thing to be saved, but we don't want to just skate along. How many times do we, we, we get in, all right, I'm saved, I'm not going to hell, that's enough right there, and I'm just going to go along on that level right there. Well, you can do that, but what happens? You usually fall away altogether. Yeah. You know how I can tell that? Because I've been in church since I was a little kid, and what happens is somebody uh, will, will miss a Sunday or two. I've, I noticed this, you know, as a pastor's family, I noticed that. And they miss a, miss a service or two, and then the next thing you don't see them for months at a time, and then they're gone all together. And I, well, you know, we kind of got away from the church, and I guess I just haven't been there for a while. How can you maintain a close relationship if we don't have a church family? I mean, our church family is precious to me and my wife and my family because they pray for us, and we pray for you, and we pray for each other. When, when we had our Sunday school class this morning, that's an intimate place to share everything. Uh, you know, you can share things that are deep in your heart because I, we feel like it, it might help somebody else in the class. And, and when you're a Christian, you have that desire to want to share with others the good things that God has done in our lives. In God's second goal of indoctrination, Timothy says uh, that God desires all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. Part of Jesus' great commission is teaching them to observe all things uh, whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew 28, 20. So when, when a family comes in or an individual comes in and they find Jesus Christ, it's still up to us to help them grow in their relationship yes. with us. We're all growing. It is nobody that's whatever age it is. If you're 80 or 90 or 70 or 60 or 5 or 6, we're not ever there, are we? We might be where the Lord wants us to be at that time, but we can still learn much more Amen. about Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever read a scripture in God's Word, and you, you knew what it said and what it was about, and you read it again two weeks later, and it was totally meant something totally different to you? There's so much. This Bible could be this thick, but it, it, it is, and it's only this thick. But you, that's a, what happens in God's Word. God has a third goal. Uh, it is the consummation of the kingdom. Paul said, then the end will come. When Christ hands over the kingdom to God the Father, and after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. God does not change in his judgment and mercy. Our passage illustrates this. Uh, it says, uh, then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a, it will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, Malachi 3.5, and all other sin. God's changeless nature guarantees this. With God, judgment is written into the very nature of things. God's judgment is clearly seen in history. Consider, for example, the Genesis account of the flood and of the destruction of the Tower of Babel and many other times. That, uh, well, Sodom and Gomorrah, for example. God's judgment is there. His his, but the history also illustrates God's mercy. At the crisis in the history of his nation, Samuel said to his people, he said, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods, gods and the Astaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. 1 Samuel 7.3 What was the result here? 
than the children of Israel did put away. Balaam and Ashtaroth, and served the Lord only. But you see, when the people repented, God's mercy broke through. Amen. God's mercy never fails, for God changes not. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him. Psalms 103, verse 17. What is the consistency or the constancy of God? This is the second one that I want to talk about, and we got about six minutes. Do you think I can get it done? <laughs> we'll try. What does the constancy of God mean from the human point of view? Well, what implication does it carry? See, the constancy of God warns us of the certainty of God's judgment. His judgment is on the unrepentant, upon those who rebel against Him. Sin has not changed, or has it its penalty? The soul that sinned, it shall die, Ezekiel 18.4. The wages of sin is still death, Romans 6.23, and nothing can unwrite that law. He hasn't changed. Just because we have changed in this earth and, and the states have okayed something or said, yeah, it's legal now. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that it's okay morally, does it? Uh, the constancy of God assures us of the dependability of His promises. The Bible is full of promises. There's thousands of promises in there. He has promised to receive us. If we decide to ask for salvation, ask the Lord to come into our heart, He has promised to receive us. And that hasn't changed. How about our prayers? The, he hears our prayers. He, he sustains us and protects us. He has promised to relieve us from our burdens and strengthen our trials. He has promised abiding fellowship. Matthew 18, 20. He gives us power. He gives us power to do the things that He asks us to do the Holy, through the Holy Spirit. His promises are not just empty words, folks. And you know, you've experienced them. His changeless nature is their guarantee. The constancy of God guarantees the security of believers. God's changeless nature is bound up with His sovereignty. Sovereignty means security. The security of believers is predicated on the sovereignty of God who does not change. That's right. You guys found anything that's secure in this world anymore? No. <laughs> it's hard to find something, isn't it? You think you're going to go buy something? You think you got you got money in the bank and the next thing you know, uh, some hacker's taking the whole thing? Uh, it, it ha can happen overnight. The funds that you have in different things are gone just like that. I, I used to work with a guy, uh, and he used to sell my buildings there back in 2012 when things went like this. He had a lot of money in the bank. He lost a half million dollars in there. You know, some of it's come back, but you see what I'm talking about? There are things in this world that you, you can't totally depend on. I think we've really learned in the past, past few years that the biggest corporations can fall, and it doesn't matter how secure they are. The one thing that is secure is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we can depend on. God who does not change. This is the rock on which our faith rests. The value of faith is in its object, and the object of our faith is Christ. If one who has trusted him or herself to God's care were to be lost, it would be necessary for God to change, and he changes not. Amen. The constancy of God provides the incentive for living. Because God changes not, life has meaning and purpose and direction. If we're going in the same direction, hand in hand with God, life has incentive. Otherwise, life is meaningless and empty. How many times do we hear of tragic things happening on the news <coughs> because people just no reason to live? They don't have a reason. 
here's a little story I want it's a it's actually uh, a poem by Edna St. Vince in her poem called Lament describes the brave efforts of a widow to help her small children adjust, adjust to the death of their father. She was trying to help her kids as they were sobbing around the house. She lost her husband and there the children's dad. She began to make clothes for the children out of his old clothes. Here you want to wear one of your daddy's shirts. She gives them their father's trinkets to play with. The poem ends on this plaintive note. Life must go on, she said. But I forget just why. See, people don't have any reason. Without Jesus Christ, there is no reason. Many people are saying the same thing today out here in our world. Two questions plague the minds of modern men and women. What does life mean? What are we here for? What's my purpose? And what in this world can be trusted to stay the same? Both questions are answered in a changeless Christ. Outside of Christ, individuals are free to choose what kind and how great a sinner they will be. They are alienated from the ground of their being. But life takes on a new meaning when a person enters a relationship just like I did. And many of all of us did. If you know Jesus Christ, it takes on new meaning when a person enters a relationship with a changeless God through Jesus Christ. How do I get that relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, you don't, to get something of value like that in today's world, how many of you have ever gone and filled out the papers for a new house and sat there with the realtors and the title company filling and signing, initialing papers about a stack like this? Am, am I exaggerating? No. I mean, if you've done that, do you realize how simple it is then to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? When you look at what it takes to sign up for something like that, and then I stand here and read God's word and say, to receive Jesus Christ in your heart, you can have this life, and all you have to do is say, Jesus, I repent of my sins, and I mean it, and come into my heart, and I want to have a relationship with you. Amen. And pray that from the depths of your heart. And then say, Lord, I... I want you to take over and steer my life. Yeah. And I'm going to let you drive. Amen. That's right. Truly, that's how you do it. Right there. So this morning as we close, would you stand with me? I want to pray a prayer with you. And if you feel like you would like to come traditionally, what we've done is ask people to come and, and pray at the altar. We have an altar in our church. If you want to come and kneel there, if you want to come and pray for someone else at the altar, beside yourself, you're welcome to always do that. If you want to receive Jesus Christ into your heart, yes, you can do it in your seat, but what a great witness it is to come before the people and do it at the altar. Yes. As we pray this morning, I'm going to come down here and pray the closing prayer. Come and receive Jesus in your heart. Our Heavenly Father, I just feel your presence in a special way. There's probably several people here this morning, maybe, that would say, Jesus, I don't have a relationship with you. And so if, the, if you came and returned in the next few days or weeks or right now, I'm not ready. And I'm afraid. All I need to do is come and say, ask you into my heart this morning and say, Jesus, come into my heart. I repent of my sins. Anything that I've done that would offend you, Lord, I give it to you this morning. And just do that right now. You can do it in your seats. But it's important that you do it and receive him into your heart. And tell the Lord, 
you take the wheel. I want a relationship with you. I believe it. I have faith. Don't let the devil take you back. He's trying to keep you from stepping out this morning. Take that first step for him. Father, I just pray for strength and courage this morning from each one of us. And we, as we go to our homes, Lord, if you're speaking to us, let us not get away from that feeling of you speaking to us. We just pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you all this morning. Thank you for coming. <laughs>